You are listening to episode number 66 of the Everything Ham Radio podcast. Today we're talking with Jim Aspinwall about uh, growing up as a ham and also about the All-Star Link Network. We're talking about some upcoming events and contests as well as some ham fest and a couple other things. So stick around. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Everything Ham Radio Podcast. This is episode number 66, and today we're talking with Jim Aspinwall. His call sign is November Oscar One Papa Charlie. He is a very interesting guy. We're talking with him about how he grew up as a ham, um, his backstory, which is extremely interesting, and, and, you know, the perfect example of what it's like or what it what amateur radio is meant to do um, as a young ham we also talk about the all-star link network and a new project that he has uh, been working on uh, for the all-star link network so make sure you stick around for the interview it's a little lengthy we've gone a little over an hour uh, with this episode so i hope you stick through to the end very interesting interview uh, a couple things. Uh, the um, show notes of today's episode can be found at everythinghamradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash 66. That's the number 66. You can find all the links that we're going to be talking about as well as additional information. So make sure you head over there and check that out. Um, you can find me on several social media pages. Um, I have a Facebook group at uh, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash everything ham radio. The page is at facebook.com forward slash everything ham radio. I'm on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash everything ham radio and on Twitter, uh, which is probably where I'm the most active at, at K5CLM. So, uh, last week. The uh, Facebook pay, uh, Facebook question of the day had some really interesting um, answers to it. Um, I really found them quite funny. Some of them. The question was, "What was your uh, what is your funniest uh, numerics? No, not numerics. Phonetics uh, that you can think of for your call sign." And I want to read a couple of them here. Um, we have. If I can bring up the page here, kind of got a little uh, out of whack of what I was planning on doing, but we're going to fly with it here. So the question of the week, like I said, what is the favorite or what is your funniest mnemonics for your call sign? Um, Mine, my call sign, uh, Kilo 5, Charlie Lima Mike. My wife came up with keeping five children uh, living on Monday because <laughs> we, we have four right now. We have four um, and we're going for adoption on them. So yay us. Uh, but anyways, uh, other people have uh, commented on the post. Uh, we have uh, N4GBN. Uh, he says, good boy, never. Come on now. You got to be a good boy sometime. Um, We have uh, Fred Wilson said that his buddy's call sign is November 5 Charlie uh, Foxtrot Bravo, which he says instead should be November 5 Catfish Bait. Um, His call sign is Aquila George 5 Papa Whiskey Alpha. Uh, He couldn't think of anything funny for him. I mean, I posted this on Friday and I I still haven't even thought about something funny for me. my wife had to think about it, but uh, I suggested maybe a perfect woman admirer, maybe, <laughs> or priceless woman admirer, something like that. Um, Jerry Decker, uh, N5RV, says his is Need 5 Raging Virgins. <laughs> uh, Steve Blackwell, K5SDB, says his is Still Doing Business. Congratulations. So... Those are just some of them. Um, actually, that's pretty much all of them. So I hope that ne- the continuing of my Facebook question of the week will continue to get more um, more participation. Uh, every week I have a Facebook question of the week, and it's in the group. Uh, so you will have to go to the group and find that to answer it. But I hope that it, all y'all will 
uh, go there and answer the question. This week's question is, what is your favorite brand of amateur radio and why? Uh, mine is Kenwood. I mean, that's that's the one that I like the most. I like the looks of it. I like the way that it operates. I like the functionality of it. Uh, I like the uh, reliability of it. Uh, the, radio, the two mobile radios that I have are the Kenwood TM733. I bought them, I bought one of them uh, about uh, three years after I got my license. And I bought a second one about three years later at Hamcom and have been using them ever since. And they have been keeping, just keeping pace, chugging along, haven't had a lick of problem with the, with the exception of one of them. Uh, the uh, uh, lighted display has gone out. But other than that, they are awesome radios. Um, I don't have a Kenwood HT anymore, unfortunately. I did have one. I had a 7, a um, uh, TH79, I believe, 79A, something like that. Had that for a while. Actually, I had two of them. Unfortunately, both of those I didn't have much luck with. But I like Kenwood. That, that, that's my favorite thing. Uh, I wish that uh, Kenwood would go maybe, well, they have gone D-Star now, but I wish they would go to System Fusion or DMR or something like that uh, with the amateur. I think they make a DMR radio, but I wish they would do System Fusion. Um, so that's my favorite brand, and that's why I like them. So what is your favorite brand? Make sure you go to the Facebook group at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash everything ham radio and answer the Facebook question of the week. Uh, something else that I have been severely lacking on doing um, is mentioning um, my Patreons. Um, I have one at the moment, so if any of y'all would like to become a Patreon, super easy to do. You can go to everythinghamradio.com forward slash support, and there's a link to my Patreon page. Um, I have one person that has been with me for... Uh, about, about 14 episodes now, and his call or his name is Brian Stanford. So, Brian, if you're listening, thank you very much for your continued support of a dollar per episode. If you would like to be like Brian and help me out, you can go to uh, page, my Patreon page and become a Patreon. You can donate one dollar per episode, uh, two dollars per episode, or five dollars per episode, I believe is what the levels are. So thanks again, Brian, for your continued support over in Patreon. If you would like to find out how else you can uh, help support this podcast, if you go to everythinghamradio.com forward slash support, there is a couple ways you can do that. So thank you very much for those of y'all that have done that, and I greatly appreciate it, as well as my sponsors. I have two sponsors right now. I have uh, West Mountain Radio, which we'll hear, you'll hear about the Rig Blaster Advantage here a little later on in the episode. And, of course, uh, Dan Romanchik just came on this month. Um, his call sign is uh, KB6NU, and he is the author of the No Nonsense uh, Study Guides. Uh, so thank you to both of those, both of my sponsors, and for all of y'all that have uh, supported me throughout my journey in podcasting. Thank you very much. So I guess that pretty much wraps up my pre-interview uh, announcements. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, and talk with Jim, shall we? Okay, so you know what? Before we do that, I wanted to make sure and let y'all know about some exciting news. Now, many of y'all have seen some of the tweets that I've been tweeting out over the past week or so. You've heard me talking about it in the past, but it's finally happening. I have a swag store. I don't have a whole lot of items in there right now, but I am continuing to work on some new projects, some new uh, things to have in there. I'm going to have some apparel, some shirts, some hats, stuff like that. I'm still working on finding a uh, uh, person to make those for me here locally, but... Um, I do have uh, some neat things on the store right now. Uh, for all your coffee drinkers, I have a uh, coffee mug and a travel mug that you can get for uh, with the Everything Ham Radio Podcast logo on it, as well as customized with your call sign and your name and call sign. Uh, call sign will go on the logo side and name and call sign on the back, on the opposite side. I have some drink coasters, uh, a mahogany drink coaster, which I love, absolutely love. I have a cork um, flat coaster, which I'm using currently here in my uh, recording studio. Uh, for y'all, the y'all that need a new mouse pad, I have mouse pads, a white one and a black one. Um, so make sure you check those out. 
Um, I'm getting some, um, possibly getting a, a wall clock as well, the, uh, an analog wall clock with my logo on it. And also I'm going to be doing the um, custom call sign desk um, plaques uh, that I gave away back in episode number 50. Uh, I am still working on that, so I don't have pictures up of it, but I'm making one for myself, and y'all will see it. Um, but check, uh, head on over to uh, everythinghamradio.com forward slash store to order the things that are on there now, and please continue to check back uh, for more things. Okay, so now, on to the interview. Hey everybody, we are here today with Jim Aspinwall, and his call sign is November Oscar One Papa Charlie. And Jim, before we go in, I think I I want to just say this. You know, when I first saw your call sign, it really threw me off because I, I never really knew, or maybe never really realized that there was a two by two call sign that started with a November. And I'm I'm thinking to myself, is this guy in the U.S. or is this guy somewhere else? So. Um, I don't know, maybe, is it, is there some reasoning behind that call sign or, or is it just kind of an out of the blue type thing? Well, it was a chance coincidence. After I got my extra, I was, uh, looking around, I was K9 GVF and prior to that WB9 GVF and WN9 GVF. So we go back a ways and I was, I was going through the, uh, all the possible available vanity call signs. And somewhere I launched on the, the N01 PC or the N01 prefixes. And I thought, well, let me just earmark that and think about this for a while. And it, it disappeared for a bit and it came back and I said, I'm going for this. And there's a little significance to it. I am, aside from a 40 plus year ham operator, a 20 plus year author and columnist in the, uh, the, the PC trade industry from software to hardware to seven published books and several columns uh, up to and including CNET. And I said, this is a pretty cool call. Uh, N01 PC, number one personal computer. So I took the chance, took the shot at merging two hobbies into one. And here we are. <laughs> About halfway through your explanation on that, I'm like, okay, okay, I can see P. Oh man, please don't. Is he a Mac user or a Linux user? And it's no one PC. <laughs> Number one PC. That that works though. That that works really well. Not that there's anything wrong with Mac or Linux, guys. You know, I have I have a Linux box here that that I have that I'm still trying to figure out how to get up. And I thank you for all the emails y'all sent me to help with that. By the way, uh, I have not done that before. Uh, thank y'all for that, but uh, I'm not going to put that in the back burner. So you mentioned that you're done a lot of columns and stuff like that. Let's, let's start a little bit further back. How did you get into the hobby? I grew up into it. My dad got his conditional license, which at the time was equivalent to a general, through his Air Force electronics training uh, in the early 50s. And so I was, I was born a ham without a license. You know, they, they could have issued me a novice when I popped out. But that didn't happen. <laughs> That would have been a, a little better incentive, I suppose. I started uh, tagging along with my dad and going to his uh, his local club meetings and in and, and field day and the local ham store ever since I was about the age of five. And every everybody knew me as as, as, as little Bill. My dad's call is uh, W nine UGT Uncle George Terror, as, uh, as as he will say it. <laughs> I'm I'm well known about uh, among the old timers as the as the kid who created uh, chaos at Field Day um, at, at a very young age. No, I didn't get my license uh, strangely enough until I was fourteen, and that was at a time. In the late uh, late 60s, early 70s, when commercial two-way radios were being surplused out and available to the amateur radio community. And by chance, my high school electronics instructor had set up a, a, a small two-way radio shop in our high school lab. Wow. And uh, just for recreational purposes or whatever, uh, and gravitating towards towards that part of radio... I was involved. I probably put more people on two meter FM in Madison, Wisconsin at the age of 14 than anybody else in the state by converting a fleet of taxicab radios to 146.94 for the local hams. 
and we were doing on the air tests with the hand, with, with the, the school call sign. And, you know, finally, uh, Bernie, uh, WA9YDW said, you need to get your license. This is ridiculous. <laughs> so uh, he, he tested, he helped me out with my, my novice. We had a small uh, club at the high school. And uh, one of my dad's uh, buddies proctored the test uh, back at that time for our novice. And about six months later, uh, Bernie was an examiner and he was, uh, he was authorized. He was able to give me my tech test at his kitchen table in 1971. So, wow. I could, we go back a little ways. Not, not, uh, not ancient, but uh, not, not yesterday. <laughs> it's just, just a little season. That's all. Yeah. I, I won't tell you when I was born. <laughs> so you started at 14 and it sounds like, you know, pretty common way of coming into amateur radio. I've heard that, you know, not so much of your extent, but getting young, being born into it. Um, I actually started when I was 16 and it was because of my dad. So you, you got your license, you did these radios, your, your website has a very interesting history to it. And, and let me just, let me just make sure I'm understanding this here. You actually built a repeater as well. I, I took advantage of the $25 taxi cab radio dealer deal that was offered locally. And I said, I got to buy a radio, which was you know, all of my allowance for, you know, six months or something <laughs> at that point and uh, bought a Motorola T43 GGV cab radio from, from the pile, converted it to AC operation by removing the vibrator part of the power supply, uh, substituted in a big filament transformer. So I had a, an AC operated radio, mobile radio. And uh, then I split the receiver and transmitter away from the chassis mounted them on separate racks and somehow bought crystals for uh, for the channel elements and through whatever circuitry was available at the time uh, cobbled together a, a basic time delay controller for it I did not have an idea concocted a single tone tone decoder and latching system and that became the control circuit for a hybrid phone patch interface for it. Wow. So not only was it a an 0464 split radio repeater, it also had an auto patch. And that went on on the top of an apartment building of a, another local ham who was a law student uh, at the University of Wisconsin. And so he uh, he provided the phone line into it, talked to his landlord. Uh, we did a split antenna thing because nobody knew duplexers from anything at that point. And that was um, one of the first two auto patches in, in Madison, Wisconsin, circa about 1972, 1973. Wow. So you actually built the, the repeater the hard way. <laughs> not like not like today where you buy the, the you know one box and, and plug it in. Uh, that's, that, that's the only way to build them. That's, I, I at that time, at, at 16, 17, my, my high school co-op work study job was working for a friend of my dad's who was the engineer for a local, uh, what's called a radio common carrier or a pager mobile phone company. And so he, he got me the job at the, at the pager bench and we had, Old uh, mobile phones, the old trunk mount radios with the uh, dial control heads for some subscribers. We had uh, walkie-talkie portable service and uh, some of the first TTL controllers of uh, of a dial-in paging voice and tone paging system. And about six months after I got that job, uh, that gentleman had left for uh, out of state for a job with Motorola Communications. And at 17, I became the chief engineer for a five-site uh, radio telephone company. And you went into IT. Well, there there was a progression from that into uh, medical electronics, uh, medical instrumentation, which was some exposure to computers. Uh, along with the uh, the radio telephone company, the owner of the company was one of the first telephone answering services with direct interconnect to. Wisconsin Telephone. So he pioneered a lot of the first third-party uh, access interfaces to uh, to the phone companies and had hired an engineer out of the University of Wisconsin to take his, uh, his phone telemetry answering systems 
from analog and servo motors, servo motors and read relays and all kinds of concoctions to the microprocessor world. So we were uh, in our shop laying out circuit boards, doing wire wrap backplanes for the eight, first 8008 processors. And I thought I, I would have to monitor the teletype machine and, and feed paper tape in to uh, create the software for these microprocessors. And I said, I have absolutely no idea how feeding letters and numbers into a teletype machine into a chip works. This is really strange. This is just, I will never be able to deal with computers. And three years later, I find myself using computers in, in medical instrumentation for uh, uh, for laboratory uh, analysis reports and things. And uh, just somehow accidentally fell into computers that way, progressed through a, scientific, a variety of scientific instrumentation that was all using some very some very early small micro uh, mini computers, and then the PC age, the eight thousand eight, the the eighty eighty six, and such came along, and that became a progression for me. And then mentored by a fellow ham and very good friend of mine, uh, Rory Burt, now KN five D, who who tutored, tutored and mentored me in the PC world, and through his notes, uh, which I still have a copy of. Uh, that we took in his tutoring sessions said, dude, we need to write a book about this because nobody can, nobody has written anything that tells people, idiots like me, what you just told me to get me to, you know, functional computer. And that became a, um, uh, started a very interesting, uh, progression of, uh, of mentoring in, in a different industry, so to speak, of, uh, of getting into my computer career. So here we have amateur radio has very strongly led into a, a widely varied career of instrumentation and uh, telemetry systems and you know, hundreds of things that one would never imagine at 14 you would ever touch. Huh. Wow. Uh, that That's like a picture-perfect, I don't know, like timeline, so to speak, of Starting with amateur radio and and building that into a career, you know, I I envy you, my friend. I I really do. I I like I said, I became a ham at sixteen, but I I nowhere near did what you did. Uh, for me, it was just a VHF communications type thing, more along the lines of like you said for emergency communications. And but I I never really went that far. It it, it amazes me really. <laughs> So uh, I was I was very lucky that um, the, the the guys that my dad hung out with had had a had a variety of military electronic experience because that's where people technical people came from at the time. Television was sort of new in the fifties. Radio was. This was even you know th- those guys came up before there was really two way radio aside from what came out of World War Two. So you had a lot of that uh, very core. You had to know electronics situation going on. Tech schools grabbed onto it. We were very, very fortunate that we had some insightful industrial arts shop class situations, which uh, which are uh, waning now. Uh, this is starting to sound like a micro works episode more than <laughs> what I'm going to go into. But it it has some value in that there are tremendous resources available because people come into amateur radio from everything from being brain surgeons to, you know, power line engineers out in the middle of Nebraska. And they all bring something to this hobby of practical, useful value or of hardcore technical value that being in, in, in Madison, Wisconsin, which is a university town, we had a number of electronics engineers that came from, you know, that worked at Motorola or interned at Motorola and built some of their, uh, their very fine equipment. So at, at 16, when you're sitting next to a, to an, to an electrical engineering student who, who helped develop the Motrack and the Micor, Mic, uh, you know, Motorola radios, you've got some resources right next door and you really want to pay attention to them if, if it meets your interest or at least you remember they were there. And, 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 and how that association works, which is very, very important in this hobby and, and, and anything. So we, we leveraged that. I, I had no idea as a kid that I, I could have or should have gone to college. I attended the Wisconsin School of Electronics, which is one of the premier pre-DeVry associate's degree programs. And after six months of that, uh, realizing that the, the work I was doing in my, in my job at 17 and 18 was 
two years beyond what the tech school was, I dropped out. And my dad was a little disappointed at that. But he's not disappointed with the results that came from the work experience. And, and that's it's that kind of grab and go and, and hopefully give back to the community that amateur radio offers more so than almost anything else you can get involved with. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, that That's the way I was when I went to school. I, I went to a technical college uh, right out of high school and all through high school, I helped with our IT departments. Uh, and when, when I went to the college, it, it was an associate's degree type thing. And all the stuff that they were teaching was, you know, years behind what I was. And I was basically teaching them but in this day and age, you need that piece of paper saying that you have some kind of degree to, to get any kind of decent job. And, of course, now I'm not even in the field anymore. So let's go ahead and move on a little bit here. So you got your license at 14. You built your, a repeater at 16. You did the, the paging company at, like, 17 or so. Let's kind of fast forward a little bit. What other kind of ham radio-related projects have you worked in in your area? Well, as a matter of coincidence, in, in part of the job path, I ended up uh, moving to, uh, to Houston, Texas in about 1978 and got involved with the, the local ham community there on 220 and, and, and learned of what in, in that area of the country is, uh, was called the Armadillo Intertie System, which is a, a multi-site UHF repeater system uh, linked all by 420 radios. And those guys had uh, developed unique squelch interfaces uh, for the Motorola radios and a very unique squ- uh, control system. And I was just getting involved with those guys when Career took a path to uh, to move to California. And the the sister or associated system with Armadillo Intertize, the Cactus Intertize system in California, which is a multi-state uh, linked UHF system. So my, my, my sort of brotherhood affiliation with their partners in Texas uh, you know, gave me entree to, into California and helped build out uh, three or four sites of, of high-level UHF repeater systems in Northern California tied back to the system. And through that, um, migrated to a system that is mostly California-based uh, called CalNet. So I maintain uh, six of the re- UHF uh, repeater sites in, in Northern California for CalNet which brings us to, you know, things of the tower climbing and, and all kinds of uh, commercial radio site experience. Uh, luckily, I had commercial radio experience as a kid and got involved with tower climbing. So I'm one of the few uh, amateur radio operators in Northern California that's OSHA certified for uh, for communications tower work. Uh, that's sort of my jungle gym. Uh, you know, it, it, it drives me to it drives me to the gym or working out a little bit so I can still go out. <laughs> So everything, you know, there, there's a life benefit to some of the things you want to do in your hobby. If you've got to climb a 100-foot tower and stay up there all day, maybe you need to get in shape. So, you know, maybe we ought to recommend amateur radio tower climbing for uh, for health pro- uh, programs at work. <laughs> um, and some of that, as that evolved, that's when we started seeing things like Echo Link and IRLP and All Star uh, and, of course, the, the DMR and the other things that are coming along with networking radio and in the internet uh, into things that, uh, that bring us here today, like, uh, you know, conversational, everyday conversational tools like Skype, which are very closely associated with what we're doing now. So one more quick question before we go to break. Um, your your linked system there in California, now I know that our good uh, friend George Zafiropoulos, I, I can never say his name, um, is over there in California. He does the the big link system. Have you ever met and worked with him? George George was one of the first people I met that was associated with the Cactus Intertie system here. And through my my, my work partnerships again, uh, met a couple of hams that uh, were part of one of the first three UHF repeaters ever built in the in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, through Jim Osborne WB six NNY a legacy in two-way radio communications in the area. And we were welcome to, to hook on to Jim's system and, and, and enjoy that. And uh, he had two repeaters, one of which didn't get a whole lot of use. And I hooked up with George, and he said, well, we need a different cactus presence up here to expand the system. And I said, well, I know a guy that's got a free, a, a free repeater pair 
that we can use if we want to hook into that. So we started bolting things together in, in, in further extending the, the cactus system from the Bay Area to Sacramento and uh, the system in the Central Valley. So uh, road trips to uh, to Meadow Lakes repeater site above Fresno were, were quite frequent as we tried to get 420 links running 150 miles over the hills and uh, and built these things up. So George was um, was very instrumental in, in helping us uh, move that along in, in in funding and his relationship with the with the cactus people and and we just kind of grew that grew from that 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 legacy system to. Um, to what's you know where we are today with various things. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and we're actually going to get into our, our topic of today. This has kind of gone a, a little differently than I planned on it, but Jim, you've got a lot of great experience, a lot of great information. I, I just couldn't stop us at, because that is really what amateur radio is all about. I mean, you are like I said, a picture a picture example of, of what amateur radio is meant to do, and meant to be, and and. So we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back, and we're going to start our conversation about the All-Star System. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Are you tired of lousy propagation conditions and wondering how to work some real DX for a change? Maybe you spin the dial and wonder what's going on below the voice segment of the HF bands. The answer is you're missing out. You're missing out on digital modes, a rapidly growing and exciting part of amateur radio. Work real DX with the incredible JT65 and JT9 modes. It's no exaggeration when I tell you, you will work stations you never thought possible, even using low power and compromised antennas. Have fun making new contacts in modes such as PSK31, Olivia, Radio Teletype, Slow Scan TV, and many more. The Rig Blaster Advantage is everything you need to operate these exciting digital modes. Made right here in the U.S., the Rig Blaster interface has set the standards for nearly 20 years. Thousands of satisfied operators have learned their Rig Blaster Advantage will provide solid digital communications, easy operating, and reliability. Don't miss out on the fun and excitement any longer. Head on over to everythinghamradio.com forward slash WMR for more information and learn how to get your free USB port monitor with your purchase. Hey everybody, we're back and we're going to talk um, in this segment, we're going to talk about All-Star. We're talking with Jim Aspinwall and his call sign is November Oscar 1 Papa Charlie. Actually, this is the second take of this part. I actually said November 01 PC just a second ago. So we had to stop and, and make a quick correction. It's November Oscar 1 Papa Charlie. So Jim, first off, what exactly is All-Star? Uh, All-Star is a radio over IP implementation or repeater and, and IP interface built on the asterisk uh, voice over IP Linux-based PBX or phone system, which was invented by Jim Dixon, WB6NIL, sadly now a silent key. It can run on Linux PCs. Uh, it most popularly now it runs on Raspberry Pi, uh, which is a very handy access to, uh, to get into this. And it leverages the analog and digital horse, analog to digital voice horsepower and conversion and the control signal axis provided by a lot of USB uh, sound chip dongles. So uh, you don't need to look at a, a big phone system or any, anything complicated. You know, a, a $20 USB uh, sound fob from Amazon, uh, a Raspberry Pi, and a little creativity interfacing it to a radio and you basically have a uh, a dial in uh, control system that can extend your uh, your local radio interface to it across uh, uh, the the public or even uh, private internet links hmm. so it's it's kind of like i guess maybe like a sister of of like d star or system fusion or d m r or something like that Yes, some of the, the early systems and, and systems people are most familiar with maybe Echolink and uh, the IRLP uh, network built by Dave Cameron out of Canada. And the the IRLP is more a a closed and infra, highly infrastructure dependent system because it's uh, it's authenticated and switched through the IRLP main server interface, 
whereas uh, Echo Link is a peer-to-peer interface that doesn't need any server uh, situation going on, uh, though there is some conversation back and forth with All Star no- or Echo Link nodes. All Star can stand alone, or um, it can draw from the, the directory services provided by the, the central All Star station. So you have a lot of options here of creating a, a private radio over IP network uh, for about a hundred dollars, or you can uh, can make it uh, more publicly accessible uh, through the All Star directory system. So I know with with like DMR and and D Star and so like that, you have to have a, a DMR or D Star actual radio. Does do you have to have that with All Star, or can any radio work? The, the good thing about All-Star is you can hook a speaker and a microphone to the sound fob interface, or you can hook up a radio, and or you can hook it, plug it into one of the uh, the link ports of your your uh, your local repeater controller. It's it's very flexible in that, uh, like many phone system situations, some of us know this is E and M signaling, where you have a, a, a duplex voice pair, and then you have a a, a signaling operation that happens uh, over the wire you can you can connect that to your rlc or any number of uh, other types of repeater controllers and and make an extension of your repeater system or you can take the the receive and transmit audio interfaces to any number of radios you can leverage you you need a push to a hard push to talk control a dc control but the system is through the USB uh, analog to digital conversion can do a sort of Vox or squelch uh, based on audio only. Most of us will use the, the, the carrier present signal, it's called COR or COS, out of the, that may be available out of any number of radios if you dig far enough into the circuitry. So uh, things like Motorola and, and General Electric commercial radios have push to talk and uh, carrier indication plumbed out their accessory connectors. Some of the uh, the Chinese radios, you can actually find the signal. Or if all else fails, you just let the sound card detect that there's a, there's a voice signal there now. Go ahead and, and, and move my uh, you know, move my traffic from one point to the other. Hmm. That is like, I don't know. It, you know, the things I, I hear with, with D-Star and, and even System Fusion and DMR and stuff like that, you have to have the special radios and... And they're not cheap, of course, you know, very seldom in amateur radio anything is. But this to me sounds like a really interesting way. Now, is this, is this digital communication or is this analog? It's all dependent on what the, what the radio side of the interface is, is connected to. Theoretically, it could be connected to a DMR radio, probably a subscriber radio, uh, and picking signals out of it. I'm, I'm not real familiar with the, the internals of DMR radios, I know that Fusion and NXDN radios can provide what you would call a subscriber, the user interface, which is analog, because our, our ears and our mouths still are still analog to this day. Maybe in 50 years, we're all going to be speaking digital, and we don't need tongues and ears, but we'll see. So theoretically, if, you, if you're familiar enough with your radio, you could probably attach this to an NXDN, certainly a D-Star, which is basically, uh, it's, it's got a, you know, an, an analog presence. D-Star is a, is a different construct of digital than, say, P25 or DMR. You can get the user, you know, analog voice transmit and receive out of a DMR radio. There are probably... Uh, interfaces that do this. Uh, it's not the the common dabbling with this that I've seen. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna backpedal out of that part of the conversation. <laughs> but I, I think it's it's possible. Anything that's got a a human interface on it should, at some level, be able to, to interface with with All Star. The beauty of it is that you can uh, you can interface it to almost any radio you can get. Uh, get receive audio out of, get transmit audio into, uh, find the push-to-talk lead, which is a very simple interface, and then determine uh, what is going to tell All-Star that, hey, I have a, I have a signal present, listen to me, and, and pass my audio through. Hmm. So do you, like, you know, have to use, like, a DTMF key combination to connect to a certain node? Or, or ha- I guess really what I'm... What I'm uh, 
kind of like give us like a broad overview of how All Star actually works. The, the beauty of it is there are two ways to get into it. You can remote uh, through web interface over the public internet if it's configured properly, if, if you allow that to happen. Uh, through your home router or your your other internet connection, there are web-based interfaces that you can talk to one controller or the other, one node or the other, and tell it that you uh, you want that node to talk to a node in Southern California or one in you know, in in London or, or Rome by by internet-based commands. But the system also decodes DTMF, so you can build. You can either use the, the default all-star DTMF control scheme, which is, is well published, or you can alter those codes for, for customization. And there's a number of macros and functions that, that, that are fairly easy to construct in the configuration so that you can, uh, you can come in from the radio either by, by publicly accessible codes or you can mask the access to it with what we typically call a a, 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 prefix, a secret prefix code to to deal with these things. Uh, so I've got uh, a couple of my nodes accessible by the Internet and have crafted the, the, the right, well, I'll we'll call it private access code for our users. From, from my radio, I can control any of the other radios on the system, by giving it a, a, a different access code and tell a node in Southern California or the UK that I want it to connect to my node or somebody else's. So it's, it's very flexible in, uh, in who and what can control it from where, which is, which is something that is not available with Echo Link, which is a strictly a peer to peer type of situation, uh, that does not uh, lend itself to radio based control. IRLP has some radio-based control uh, in it, but it is it is an infrastructure-tied system. You need connectivity back to IRLP Central to to make that work. In this case, All-Star can stand by itself. The uh, the, the Pi or the Linux computer hosting it, and the software is robust enough that an All-Star node can actually be your repeater controller if if you want it to be um, as such. Many of the nodes are simply simplex radios in, in somebody's garage, but we're also looking at extending and replacing some of the five and six hundred dollar uh, off the shelf repeater controllers with uh, you know thirty five dollars worth of Raspberry Pi to be our repeater controller, which will do voice or CW ID, will allow us to do link connections or port to port connections um, very flexibly. It, it's not only a way to explore the world through through internet or whatever other kind of network, if you want to do private microwave hop or whatever between sites, is is a good quick way to build up just a simple repeater. You don't even need to use the All Star IP interface. A Raspberry Pi and a radio interface on it for about seventy or eighty dollars, you've got a repeater controller. You can make do whatever you want. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's amazing with these Raspberry Pis and Beagle Bones and and Arduinos and stuff like that can do nowadays. If only it was that easy back when you built that first repeater when you were 16, right? <laughs> yeah, and I think and you bring in Arduino to this, the the Raspberry Pi is powerful as computers it is, and it has its own sound built in. And, and a lot of people will come in and ask, well, why do you need an external USB or sound interface to this? And part of it is you don't if you don't need to, don't burn the horsepower of the Raspberry Pi computing environment doing analog to digital conversion. Let the sound card chip do it by itself. Offload that processing so you can use the, the Pi processing to do the switching and interfacing with, with other functions and, and other tie-ins. So that's, that's one of the big things everybody asks about is, uh, there's an audio plug on the Pi. Why, why do I want to use this other thing? And it's, it's simply offloading that function. Similarly, there are a number of Arduino interfaces coming about that will help with the interfacing uh, from the Pi environment to uh, remote control HF, to rotor controllers for HF, antenna switching, uh, linear amplifier switching, and those things. So there's, um, it's, it's not, not limited to just making your $35 Chinese handheld 
talk to somebody in Italy over the internet, it can start to be the foundation for remote HF operations and a, a, a lot of other very flexible remote base remote control situations, be they simplex or, or duplex. Wow. It's still so far over my head, but it sounds so awesome. <laughs> um, let's see. So we talked about how it actually works. Um, how, how did you get into, or how did you find the All-Star thing? Or did, why did you decide to go with All-Star rather than D-Star or DMR or something like that? Well, I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm very fascinated by DMR. I saw some of the very early DMR uh, on demonstration about five or six years ago at an emergency communications event that I was part of hosting uh, through Carnegie Mellon University here in the Silicon Valley. And Motorola had brought out uh, one of their design engineers and a system and, and let us play with it as part of that event. And the, the whole Moto Turbo network system is, is a tremendously powerful, very, very powerful contained networking scheme between radios. And to the extent, I can't speak to this specifically, but there are a couple of global, well-known, very high-tech global corporations that run their entire enterprise connectivity and communications intersite over one of the biggest DMR networks in the world, uh, be it shipboard or overseas, a whole bunch of things going on there. But that's a very contained, very expensive, very controlled, highly controlled environment and very limited to what it can do for outside interfacing. I've dabbled in IRLP. I have a, an IRLP node here uh, at the house, which is is kind of on a dummy uh, placeholder radio on the bench. IRLP is infrastructure required. Everything must be authenticated and flow through uh, the IRLP. D-Star, I'm not really familiar with its its networking capabilities, but it is proprietary. Personally, I am an audio guy. I've worked in broadcast, so I know what 100 kilohertz broadband FM sounds like, and it's tremendous. Um, and I just don't like the idea of listening to Cylon uh, robot voices uh, coming out of my radios. So when when you get a system that is as pure telephony audio and easy to implement is, is All Star. It's, it's kind of a natu natural gravity. I've got Echo Link nodes. Uh, I talked to a lot of my my friends over them, uh, but All Star it gives you so much. I, I don't want to say hackable in a negative context, but so much hackable capability without the pri proprietary and network disciplines of something like Moto Turbo DMR and, and the like. Okay, so do you do you have um, All Star on all the repeaters that you have, or just some of them? Or well, that's that's evolving, and, and and this is this becomes more important now in terms of radio site access, uh, the cost of repeater sites, the cost of how much rack space you take up, how much power you you, you draw in your rack, uh, as to how much rent you pay. So we've got, uh, among the six sites that, that, that we're intertied with, we've got one that strangely went down and blew a power supply and was kind of an orphan. And we said, well, we really only need this thing to be a repeater site, but we want it linked in. Do we really have to spend two 420 radios and the power requirement if I can make that hop over the Internet, which was not as ubiquitous getting places as it is today. So... One of our key sites, we are going to convert from four 420 links and a 440 radio to one all-star node and a 440 radio and shrink the rack space we take up by about, uh, by about 80%. Our power consumption and, and thus our rent profile will, will decrease significantly. And through that, through that one internet connection, we can, we can tie it to three, four, five, six other sites without having this, this burden of all these radios to maintain and, and tune up and antennas on the tower and things like that, we've got my current node access to the system is in my garage with, a, with an RF link to a local hilltop. That local hilltop has got uh, five 420 links that are very expensive in terms of rack space and maintenance and tower space. We will probably shrink that site down to 
one third of a six foot rack, uh, mostly the 440 repeater and a 420 control node and, and do the linking over all star again, whether I, uh, luckily raspberry Pis in the interface take up very, very little rack space compared to, uh, to a 420 link radio and a set of cavities. I can, I can grow that site in that same rack space in a third of the rack space to cover many, many other notes. So there's, there's an economy of scale and simplicity for our radio site environment, uh, our cost profile, uh, energy consumption, however, however you want to look at it. The only risk we have in doing some of this, unless we set up our own private IP networks through Ubiquity and any other things that, that people are dabbling with now, many of the link systems that we've enjoyed over the years uh, have been more resilient than anything else because we provide our own backbone. We are infrastructure agnostic in terms of uh, the, the world blowing up, uh, you know, power going away, the Internet going away, and things like that. We've always been pretty much self-sufficient on our own linking systems, RFY, self-sufficient. So we're, we're trying to balance which strategic sites do we want to maintain RF links for uh, that are not infra, uh, infrastructure dependent and which sites are uh, strategically and tactically important if the big one hits Northern California. So we're, we're going to do a balance and, and kind of weigh that out. And there's there's some benefit, and even if we're not all-star linked between the sites, having a, an all-star node, say in our big site in San Francisco, we're, we're very happy to be the third ever amateur radio repeater system uh, at a big, uh, iconic tower site in San Francisco. Uh, we've got IP up there. Uh, we can uh, control that system off the backbone network and let it stand alone uh, to serve the San Francisco area immediately if they have an emergency and provide remote access. So if, uh, say, the, the State Office of Emergency Services needed a very strategic, specific link into San Francisco, we can provide them big-time coverage, and all they need is a $70 pie set up at you know, OES headquarters or one of their affiliates, and th- they have one of the biggest repeater systems in San Francisco at their access, and we don't have to provide an RF link for it. That's amazing. It really is. Um, so last question I have before we take a quick break. Um, do you have to have a the all-star lo- uh, node on a repeater site, or can you do like, like you can with uh, D-Star and, and have a – Kind of like a, a separate node to use uh, a handy talkie with, like if you're at a, a hotel or something like that, and you want to speak into the All Star Network. Can you do something like that? Well, that's that's the cool thing. There doesn't have to be a repeater. We're just talking a way to get voice into the system and and voice out. So there uh, there is a web what's called a web transceiver interface to uh, to each node so you can you can uh, use, use your uh, Firefox web browser to talk to an all-star node yeah. that you have you're given access to there is a a SIP or voice over IP telephone program that you can run on Apple or Android or iOS so i have the application on uh, on my android phone and all i got to do is dial up my node uh, over the internet on my Android phone, and I've got a push to talk button on the screen of my Android phone to, to interface with this thing. So it's in that way, it's very much like Echo Link. Uh, you can carry it around with you. You could carry a Pi interface around with an with an earphone and a microphone on it to, to pretend you're a radio in a remote situation. The possibilities of once you get out of the Pi and the USB interface. Whatever you connect it to is is endless, and I know people are doing this networking. Uh, there are all star networks for the GMRS service, which is is fascinating that uh, that some of the GMRS people are actually you know are, are, are really up to speed in being able to to extend their those kinds of systems. But the the user interface to all star is so flexible for any computing platform or radio platform you want. It does not require a repeater. Many of us are building uh, building nodes that we take on for travel, much like uh, folks have done for Echolink nodes, taking 
a used mobile rig or a cheap handheld and putting it in a box and saying, okay, when I get to my hotel room, uh, I need to configure my, my all-star, my, my Raspberry Pi to talk to Wi-Fi in the hotel, and I've got an all-star node in my hotel room for the duration of my trip. Uh, very, very cool uh, presence, and, and I've got some embellishment on that that, uh, that, that we'll get to, uh, which would be fascinating, I think. Okay. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more in the next segment. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to be right back. And we're going to talk about his this really neat little package thing that he has on his website. Very has great pictures, great illustrations, and a whole lot more. So we're going to talk about that when we get right back. So hang on with us, and uh, after this quick word, we'll be right back. Hi. This is Dan, KB6NU, author of the No Nonsense Amateur Radio License Study Guides. My study guides have helped thousands get their license or upgrade to general class or extra class, and they can help you too. What makes them unique is my no nonsense style. I don't bamboozle you with a lot of text. Instead, I give you just what you need to know in a simple, straightforward way that's designed to help you pass the test. One reader even told me, your study guide explained in a couple of paragraphs topics that the license manual needed a couple of pages to cover. Another wrote, the clarity and simplicity of your descriptions blew the license manual away. My study guides are available in paperback, in a variety of ebook formats, and even as audiobooks. Get your copy today. Go to kb6nu.com slash ethr for more info. Thanks. And we are back. We are talking again with Jim Aspinwall, uh, November Oscar one Papa Charlie. Yay. I got it right. <laughs> so in the last segment, we talked about really what all star is all about. And at the very end, we kind of talked about, um, a project that you're working on and, I've looked at this at your website on this little wireless node that you have, and I must say it's it's a very neat thing, and it looks fairly easy to to uh, implement. I guess you can say. Can you tell us a little bit about the the project that you're working on? Cool. It's uh, I, I call it my my, my porta node, and it, it 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 grew out of the idea of. Looking into retirement, we're going to be traveling in our Airstream trailer to places unknown. <clears throat> and I thought, how am I going to maintain a link to my, my, my drinking buddies back here in California unless I do it by HF? And there's a whole other story about uh, OnStar by HF on a road trip we can, we, we, we can talk about offline. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to extend that idea of uh, of being part of the CalNet system, even maybe the Cactus system, a couple of other local systems, which are you know, which are my, my everyday carry for ham radio activity. And there were there are some projects that folks are working on of building micronodes, which are not very well documented and easily sourced. And so I said, A, I need a Pi. B, I need a radio interface of which there are a, a couple available, and see, I just need a cheap radio on the back end, and I only need, you know, a couple hundred yards of coverage around the Airstream. So that was enticing. And the fact that you can turn uh, an, an all-star node is it, part of a SIP or a VoIP phone system was equally compelling because I thought, when we hit the road, how are people going to know how to get a hold of us? So there are online PBX services. That I thought I will subscribe to one of those, assign a phone number to my nodes, and people can dial into the the PBX, and you know press one for Kathy's phone, press two for Jim's phone, press three for the for the Airstream, and whether it rings a phone in the Airstream over the internet, or press four to ring the Airstream's All Star node, we'll have a, a, a UHF presence uh, in the in the travel trailer. So that spawned. Um, we're going to be we're going to be very small on space. We, we don't need to don't need to bring a rack of equipment with us. We can put this in a shoebox, literally, uh, or less. And uh, as I was evolving that, I got a pile of radios in the back room here. But 
Um, Amazon's got this Bofang BF888 UHF radio, which is a 16 channel, no front panel, no bells and whistles kind of radio. For 15 bucks, I can, you know, I can, I can blow up a radio and try this. It, it becomes the cutest little thing. Um, yeah, and then the implementation of the radio part of it is probably most important from, from the radio aspect of it. If anybody's had any experience at all with these Chinese radios and the tests the ARRL and, and others have done, what we have here is, is a, is a, um, is a radio on a chip on a circuit board that's, that's not shielded, not filtered, really, really not a very good radio. But luckily it's only a watt out and it's 15 bucks. So I was determined that if I was going to do this, I was going to make sure that the radio could not possibly or reduce the, the radio's possibility of interfering with any of the USB or other computing or other electronic devices around. So, so the first thing I have to do is repackage. i got to get the radio to get the signals anyway. So I'm going to build it in a shielded box, which it does not come with naturally. So that's one of the pictures is putting this in a cast aluminum LMB box to give it, to give it some isolation shielding and a foundation to wire from. There are other interfaces documented on the web, people drilling holes in a plastic case and routing these big wires onto the, the BF-88. And I said, so, you know, you've got to power the thing, you've got to do all this other stuff. So the, the golden part of this, the weird part, is t- taking the, the exposed Chinese chi- chip radio and shielding it to protect the environment, powering it, and giving it a sturdy platform to interface from. So... Dug around on that radio. I gutted, gutted the BF-88, stripped it out of its box, poked around, looked for carrier signal, found the right PTT point. Uh, the, the microphone and the audio, uh, the receive audio points are, are fairly obvious, but um, and there's no schematic for these things. Or if there is, there's no circuit board layout that tells you where they are. So you, you it, it, it's a good time to experiment and learn how a radio works, or or how you expect it to work, and and provide it. A, a standard five wire interface out of the radio to whichever you choose as your USB interface into the Pi. In my case, um, I tried finding USB sound dongles that I had access to all the signaling, the push to talk and the carrier signaling, but many of the $9 dongles off Amazon are chip on board masked with epoxy and you don't have access to the signals you need. And, and out of this, there's the, the URI interface, which is about $90. And I stumbled across Kevin Custer's uh, what's called an RA35 interface board, which includes the sound chip and the radio interface expertise of Kevin, who is one of, if not the founder of repeaterbuilders.com, a great resource for anything radio uh, related for, uh, for amateur radio repeaters and, and commercial radio gear. And they uh, they provide the RA35 board as a uh, as a fully built and assembled device or as a kit. And I find soldering kind of a cathartic exercise after a day of work. So I uh, bought the bought his kit for thirty five dollars and sorted out the resistors and capacitors. It's a great uh, great soldering exercise. Great practice for uh, for Elmering if we ever get to that with folks. So it was very uh, very satisfying to build the board myself. And uh, just work out the wiring interface to this. Uh, you can see by the by the pictures that those three chassis are all about the same size. And now the trick is, what what orientation or what packaging of the box is there going to be? To, to, how can I shrink this down and still provide DC in, which is unique in this environment, uh, and an SMA connector out for the for the RF because I wanted to be very careful about the RF profile of the thing. All of this was was wired up. You'll notice, hopefully in the pictures, if not, I'll take another shot, that rather than use the, the god-awful huge USB-B connector on Kevin's board, I scrounged in the junk box, found a USB-A cable, snipped it off at about six inches, and directly soldered the USB cable to the RA35, saving real estate and not wanting to wad up six feet to shield the cable in the box. I'm trying to make it a very tight package that way. The entire package is run off uh, all, all, all off 5 volts. The, the Pi takes 5 volts uh, on a micro-USB connection. 
The RA35 gets its 5 volts off the USB connection, so that's provided for. The only thing that was was a little bit tricky and took a little custom quasi-engineering, we'll say, was powering the uh, the Bofang 888. That radio operates at about 3.7 volts. So one needs to take a 5-volt source and isolate it down, drop the voltage from 5 to about 3.7 volts, which can be easily done with two series diodes to, to get the voltage down so the BF-88 doesn't shut itself down. So we've got an entirely 5-volt run node that will operate wirelessly if you had a wireless USB uh, dongle to it or over the Ethernet. And I chose to power it off of a PowerWorks USB buddy, which from an, an Anderson PowerPole 12-volt connection gives you 3 amps at 5 volts, which is more than enough power to run everything. Hmm. So basically you, you power your Pi... And then you, you go off of the Pi USB to power the, uh, the R, RA35, and then you go from, do you go from your Pi to the, uh, 888 to power it, or do you have a separate power connection for that? I am drawing the radio power from another USB plug bridged off the USB buddy. And you know, I think I can get it off of uh, off of Kevin's DB9 connector. Uh, there's probably an implementation in, on the breadboard in the shop that's doing that. So it's it's basically a serial leapfrog from the USB buddy through the Pi, uh, through USB to the RA35 to 5 volts, uh, bridge through that to the radio. So the radio only needs two cables, one for the for the antenna and one for the interface, the RA35, for power and uh, audio and signal. So can you run this little kit, little package here off of like a um, a battery, or does it have to have AC? Well, that's I was just thinking about that because I've got a I've got a, a Mophie uh, you know portable cell pack that uh, you know everybody ought to carry around with them when they're traveling. There are any number of these lithium ion uh, backup batteries, so you don't lose your cell charge. So um, for a package about the same size of the, as the Pi, you, you can have a, you know, a 10,000 milliamp battery pack run this thing. So I guess if, if you had wireless available, you could have a completely off-the-grid port node off-the-grid more or less, port node in a cigar box that's, that's running as, as long as you've got the, the lithium-ion pack running it at 5 volts. So this, this little kit that you built then basically is just like a... Uh... A, uh, I can't think of what the name of the thing is. It drives me crazy. I've been trying to think of it now for the past 20 minutes or so. The little D-Star uh, hotspot, basically. Um, right. So you can take right. this to a hotel room or something like that and hook Wi-Fi to it and use your handheld to, to talk wherever you want. That's, that's the exact concept. And I'm, I'm really kind of surprised that somebody hasn't prepackaged this Easily, there are a, a couple of examples uh, that show up on Facebook once in a while of a, of a gentleman who's got an entire package with a little radio chip, uh, you know, probably a ten dollar radio on a, on a board, built into something the size about the size of the Pi. But it's not a commercial project. It's it's not an available kit, and it's not very well documented. It's a very cute. But it's it's not ready for other people to build it yet. We're all trying to mock that, mimic that, and hope that it becomes a kit for you know seventy nine, eighty dollars, or, or whatever it's going to cost. There, there's some custom circuit work that would have to be done to to make it available to the masses. But this is a way to replicate that in in three or four very easy packages, which I think for somebody getting into the hobby or wanting to do this. It, it, it bridges the computer world of dabbling with a Pi, a really cool little interface, and sitting down at the workbench for about an hour in an evening, building your interface, and actually seeing something you created come to life that has got global reach in your hand. Not just D-Star, not this whole convoluted, uh, well, I, don't, I should say convoluted, but this, this heavily architected DMR system. You build a, a global presence in the palm of your hand by yourself. How much does this whole kit, basically, I guess you could say, cost you? 
based on what I bill out and my hourly rate, uh, it's, it's just horribly expensive. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the pie kit, uh, a pie with a case is about $42 at Fry's or on Amazon. The RA35 is $35 in a couple of bucks postage from Kevin. You get a bag of resistors and capacitors you get to sort out, which is fun to do. The B, BF888, uh, I paid $15 on Amazon for mine. And so we're looking at hundred bucks. You know, I'm sorry. About a hundred bucks. Yeah, we're we're looking at about a hundred bucks. You got to go scrounge for a couple DB9 connectors and some cable. You can go find an old keyboard extension cable and and have the interface. You know, there's. I think all of us computer geeks have got more wire in our junk box than <laughs> you could possibly imagine. So go get out the wire cutters and and find a decent piece of shielded cable. It's got uh, five or six conductors inside for the. Uh, uh, for the radio to RA35 interface. If you don't want to, if you can't find a DB9 or you think it's a huge connector, ditch that and, and wire directly to the RA35. It doesn't matter. There's no requirement these things have connectors. You got solder and wire. Uh, you know, go for it. Circumvent that part and uh, you know, they, they do it that way. Um, you know, you're going to need uh, something of a regulator to bring. Uh, Bring the voltage down into the BF888, and that's two 50 cent diodes from Fry's, a couple of 1N 4001s, maybe a couple of fuse holders, just so this thing doesn't, you know, doesn't flame out in your in your back pocket. <laughs> yeah, that would be a bad thing. And uh, I, I think for a hundred, you know, say say 120 bucks, you can, uh, and, and you know, you, you've got something that is that could be a very proud uh, entry into the world of repeaters. Um, you've still got a Raspberry Pi there, and if you want to, if you got a repeater in your garage, start learning and interface that. Uh, there's all kinds of possibilities. So, is there any kind of uh, special uh, software or anything that you have to have that you have to put on the Raspberry Pi to make this work? Right. There are there are two very popular builds of of the All Star uh, Link software. One is uh, from AllStarLink.org. Which is the original uh, builds that uh, the Jim Dixon uh, created, uh, and there's a lot of support. And there's also a gentleman by the name of Crompton, and I don't have his links. We can we can peg those in later. Um, who also does a, a different build, which is a little more feature rich as far as some of the uh, the built-in web interfaces and status that is a little more user friendly. He's got a very very user friendly automated. Uh, Set up script in his software, uh, leads you through all of the steps, um, and some, some very, it's very feature rich. Um, but it's a branch of the original code, which many of the diehards who are Linux geeks, uh, you know, prefer the original All Star builds, but, uh, the, the Crompton builds are, uh, are, are proving to be, uh, quite reliable and quite popular and easy access to the system right now. So which uh, which Raspberry Pi are you running off of it, or will any of them really work? The bare minimum, well, it's hard to find anything other than the uh, the, the Pi three plus right now. The twos and the, the early threes are probably no no more unless somebody's got one they're going to give you, uh, and they will work just fine. There are different there are different software builds you have to download and use depending on the generation, uh, simply because of the drivers and, and the hardware that you're talking to. Other than that, the, the software basically functions the same no matter what platform you're on. Now, will the, will this work with like the? Uh, uh, I, I want to say there's like a Raspberry Pi Nano or something like that. Or am I getting getting that mixed up with like the uh, uh, Arduino? The, I, I I can't say specifically. I have not researched that far into what. Uh, you know, if it's got enough processor and memory to, to handle the functions that are going on here, the the beauty of anything in the Pi field is uh, Linux is universally supportable, and <clears throat> so there's there's benefits to whatever can be done in Pi because you get a command line interface, you have you have access to to the guts of the system. Almost everything Arduino, unless it's purpose built. And Arduino doesn't have the horsepower to do this. There, there just isn't the uh, the operating system and the features and security built in. So, uh, doing this on a in a small Linux base is pretty good. But I really can't say about anything smaller than the the, the Pi threes that are ubiquitous. Um, that w- what would happen? I I I might imagine with with 
using the external sound and signaling that uh, eventually somebody is probably going to build a, a single point all star node uh, on the smaller pi. That would be very very uh, that, that that would compact this even more, which would be very cool. The the, the Internet of Things to radio uh, starts becoming a more and more real possibility every day as people shrink uh, shrink technology to yeah. that song. Yeah. I'm looking at the Raspberry Pi website right now. It's the Raspberry Pi Zero W, which has the built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth as well. And the specs on it is really not that much difference. One gigahertz versus 1.4. It has a single uh, USB mini, I guess, on-the-go port is what it's called. So um, I guess maybe potentially it could work. But potentially somebody's going to have to do the build. In the software, and I don't doubt that these guys are, are, are building that. You, if it's got built-in Wi-Fi, that takes the, that can displace the uh, the lack of Ethernet uh, connection, which is fine. Uh, the thing will work fine over Wi-Fi. That's what a, a lot of people are using that. The, the need for a Cat5 cable, you know, in this day and age of miniaturization, you look at that RJ45 connector with that, you know, with that quarter-inch cable coming out of it. Go, this is huge. <laughs> this is not what I want. So doing things over Wi-Fi is is great. Um, it will get tricky in in the port node environment doing Wi-Fi only on having on that that the only access to it. In that, as you switch hotels, campgrounds, or wherever your presence is, you need to get into that device and reconfigure the Wi-Fi for what it's going to talk to. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be a limitation in the um, in the smaller version. That does not have Ethernet. So for, for a port of node, you're going to carry around and you will be in a dynamic environment. Even if you're going to connect to Wi-Fi, you, you're probably, you're still going to need that Ethernet cable to your laptop to, uh, to get into the configuration and say, okay, well, I'm now on the Marriott Wi-Fi versus the Holiday Inn. Right. There's some, there's something to be said for the, the, the larger interface in, in the uh, go around. Yeah, it really doesn't save me that much. I mean, yes, it, the, the zero is quite a bit footprint wise smaller but the three is still comparable to the other pieces of uh, uh small computers i guess you could say circuit boards uh anyways so i mean it looks like it all fits in the box so that's really what matters right <laughs> yeah and the, and the box isn't that big a deal uh, the 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 one thing in in terms of not only the the, the, the travel and road convenience but there's the the strategic tactical uh, field EOC, get online, get connected anywhere kind of aspect. When you deal with um, the other part of amateur radio, public service, public community, uh, public safety, just about every MCOM mobile command post has got satellite internet or maybe some interface to the Verizon network or AT&T if they bring out a cell on wheels. So you're, you're almost assured that you're going to have Ethernet on site in, in an emergency situation, if that's what you're into for, you know, your hobby or, you know, your contribution to it. So I know the state of California has got an extensive satellite network and, and many satellite enabled portable mobile vehicles. So if you needed to set up a presence in the field, you just bring the cigar box along with you, have enough knowledge to give it, the, give it the right IP address and you know, if you're out in the boonies in the Sierra Nevada where you have no access to anything else, um, you've got a satellite internet link and suddenly you can expand your MCOM network, your amateur radio MCOM network or GMRS or whatever you want to tie to it. There's no limitation of what the radio is on the other side. So here's a perfect example to, to tactically expand, extend, uh, a public safety network with a radio interface out in the, out in the field where uh, there is commercial equipment that does that, an, an ACU 1000 or 2000 commercial MCOM package is a couple $5,000 box. If I can bring into an emergency situation a $100 box and extend my public safety channel into the boonies, uh, w- what a great thing we've done for, for public safety. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jim, I think that's about all the questions that I have. Is there anything else that you want to that you want to touch on before we uh, wrap it up for today? Well, I think in this context, it, it, the, given uh, we, we've got pies, we've alluded to Arduino a little bit, 
this this is a a good uh, a good point to refer folks to look at the maker fairs, look at tech shops, look at access to uh, other expertise and ideas of what to do with with what we handed you for a hundred dollars. This is this is almost unlimited potential uh, to 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 play with radio, uh, to build something out of, of, of radio and communications. Work with computers, you know, work with your hands. So it it fits into almost everything amateur radio is is mm-hmm. grab a pile of stuff and make something of it and uh, and, and you know, leverage and, and, and share and, and get a skill out of it from from soldering and if you can't solder for beans well we got plugs <laughs> and uh, if you're if, if you don't like hardware there's certainly a lot of opportunities to do things in software that will be very creative so there's there's something in this little project for just about everybody and it, it's a great thing I, I think this is pretty cool and if we can extend this to Remote controlling an HF radio across the world. I mean, it, it, it's it's a wide open world, and I'm just uh, just so happy this came along. Uh, you know, we we spent years building the stuff out of out of old taxi cab radios, and now we can put it in the palm of our hand, mm-hmm. and it weighs you know, it weighs two pounds. Wow. It's, it's Technology has really come a long way. So, Jim, where can uh, where can the listeners find your website and you online? My webpage is www.no1pc.org. It's focused on uh, Elmering and uh, and the hopefully the best of the best references of uh, RF and practical technology. I, I very much believe in Elmering. I've got a Facebook uh, group called Amateur Radio Elmers. Uh, I invite all comers to that. I'm, I'm very much in tune to the right information, technically accurate. So, uh, you know, if people can, can feel safe to, to, to throw out any question they want and we will find them an answer. I, I truly enjoy people asking questions. It, uh, it challenges me to improve my knowledge or go find them information they need to, to move on, uh, without a lot of noise and headaches. So yeah. that's what we're all about here. Absolutely. Well, Jim, thank you very much for coming on today and talking to us about All Star and, and about you, that, you know, your history is, like I said, is very amazing and is the picture perfect, uh, example of what amateur radio is all about. So again, thank you very much for coming on and, uh, I guess we will talk to you some other time. Well, I, I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm flattered and, and honored to be here, Curtis. And, uh, ho- hopefully we do something for, uh, for, for the rest of us, uh, the old timers and, uh, certainly wel- welcome the newcomers to, uh, to enjoy this hobby to its fullest because you never know, you know, what, what, uh, from, from 14 year old, uh, you know, 40 years later, the things you will have encountered in a career that uh, is very rewarding. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, y'all. Well, we are going to go ahead and close up with Jim, and we'll be right back with the the, uh, uh, upcoming event. So stay tuned for that. Hey, everybody. First off, let me apologize for some of the audio quality in that uh, was not the best at times. Uh, You know, I was on my uh, my cell phone hotspot and uh, didn't have the best internet connection, I, I guess, uh, some of the times. So, uh, apologize for some of the audio quality. I tried to do the best I could to kind of clean it up a little bit. So, um, let's go ahead and get on with the upcoming events. First off, all the times that I'm going to be saying are going to be in UTC time. So, make sure you adjust your times accordingly to your time zone. First off, we have the 1010 International Spring Contest on digital uh, that will be April 29th from 001 to the 30th at 2359. We have the Halibata Contest on the 29th from 1300 to 1259 on the 30th. The Florida QSO Party starts at 1600 hours on the 29th and runs to 159 on April the 30th, and then continues from 12 to 21.59 on the 30th. We have the AGCWQRP party, and that is the uh, 1,300 to 1,900 hours on the 1st. The ARS Spartan Sprint is on May the 2nd from 100 to 300 hours. Again, we have the 1010 International Spring Contest. This time it's going to be on CW. That is on March the 6th, starting at 001 and running to 2359 on the 7th. 
We have the F9AA Cup on PSK from 1200 hours on the 6th to 1200 hours on the 7th. We have the ARI International DX Contest that is on May the 6th from 1200 hours to 1159 on the 7th. The 7th Call Area QSO Party on May 6th from 1300 hours to the 7th at 700 hours. The Indiana QSO Party is on May 6th starting at 1500 hours and running to 300 hours on the 7th. The Delaware QSO Party is also on the 6th. This one starts at 1700 hours and runs to 2359 on May the 7th. And last but not least, we have the New England QSO Party, and it runs on March the 6th, starting at 2,000 hours, goes to 500 hours on the 7th, and then continues from 1,300 hours to 2,400 hours on the 7th. That wraps up the events and the contest for the next two weeks. All the information was taken from the WA7BNM contest calendar, which you can find a link to in the show notes of today's episode. All right, so next up we have the Ham Fest for the next two weeks. We have quite a few of them here, so I'm going to kind of go through them kind of fast. And if I mispronounce any of the words, I apologize in up front. First off, we have on the 28th in Charlotte, North Carolina, we have the 2017 SVHFS Conference. On the 29th in Pooler, Georgia, we have the CARS Swap Meet Ham Fest. In Waldo, Florida, we have the Gainesville Ham Fest. In Glenwood, Iowa, we have the Heartland Hams Ham Fest. Jackson, Ohio, we have the Jackson County ARC Ham Fest. West Monroe, Louisiana, we have the Louisiana Section Convention. In Morgantown, West Virginia, we have MCARC Morgantown, West Virginia Ham Fest. Then over in Albuquerque, New York, New Mexico, not New York, we have the Spring Tailgate. In Plymouth, Minnesota, we have the TCFMC Spring Tailgate. Sonoma, California, we have the Valley of the Moon ARC Annual Ham Fest. And in Spring Grove, Pennsylvania, we have the York Ham Fest. On the 30th, in Athens, Ohio, we have the Athens Ham Fest. And in Middleton, Middletown, New York, we have the Orange County ARC Ham Fest. The next weekend, on the 4th, we have the Military Radio Collectors Group Convention in San Luis Obispo, California. Totally butchered that name. Sorry about that. On the 5th, in Deerfield, New Hampshire, we have the New England Amateur Radio Festival, Nearfest uh, 21. On the 6th, in Superior, uh, Wisconsin, we have the ARAC Ham Fest. In Spartanburg, South Carolina, we have the Blue Ridge ARS's 58th Annual Ham Fest. In Cadillac, Michigan, we have the Cadillac Amateur Radio and Computer Swap. In Sierra Vista, Arizona, we have the CARA Ham Fest. In Fayette, Alabama, we have the Fayette ARC Frog Fest 2017. In Wasilla, Arkansas, we have the MARA Ham Fest. In Las Cruces, New Mexico, we have the Mesilla Valley Radio Club Bean Feed and Ham Fest. So, beans and ham. <laughs> In Cedarburg, Wisconsin, we have the ORC Spring Swap Fest. In Reno, Nevada, we have the Reno Ham Fest. And we have the Greater Hangerstown Ham Fest in Boonesboro, uh, Maryland. On the 7th, we have the Eastern Pennsylvania Section Convention in Bristol, Pennsylvania. We have the Jackson County ARC Ham Fest 2017 in Ripley, West Virginia. And last but not least, the DeKalb Ham Fest in Sandwich, Illinois. All the information was taken from the ARRL Ham Fest calendar for this section. So I totally skipped a section, a segment of my podcast 
that I've been working or that I started a couple episodes ago, and that is the ham blog spotlight. So I wanted to go ahead and put this in, even though it is out of order, and hopefully you're still stuck around with me here. So in this week's ham blog spotlight, it's actually not on a actual uh, individual hams blog. The blog post was taken from amateurradio.com. Um, and it's written by Andrew Garrett, uh, Mike Zero, November Robert, November Romeo Delta. Uh, and he talks about his experience at activating his first Soda Summit, which is uh, Summits on the Air. So if you go to the uh, show notes of today's episode, there is a link to his blog post in the show notes. So about, you know, quarter way down or so, something like that. So make sure you check that out. Uh, pretty interesting story about his first activation. And congratulations to Andrew, uh, even though you probably don't listen, but uh, congratulations anyways. All right, so that pretty much wraps up this episode. Gone kind of long, about an hour and a half now, so I apologize for that. Uh, but uh, I hope that you found a lot of great information in the interview with Jim. Um, as well as some other information. So uh, I want to thank each and every one of y'all for, for listening to my podcast. Without you, uh, what, I don't even know if I would do it, uh, honestly. I, I do this for you, uh, even though it is fun for me. Um, but but thank you. Thank you for each and every one of you that listen. Uh, thank you for each one of you that comment on Facebook post or reply to me on uh, Twitter. Uh, or leave a comment in the show notes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all f- who uh, share uh, my con- my podcast with your friends. Uh, I've seen some awesome growth over the past uh, four months or so, so thank you all for that. Um, if you would like to support financially of this podcast, there are several ways you can do it. You can make a one-time contribution through PayPal, which there's a link at the bottom of the show notes. Um, you can become a per-episode um contributor through patreon or you can simply shop on amazon.com through my affiliate link Um, i also have a couple other affiliate links on the website that you can check out Um, you can find more information on how you can do all of these at everythinghamradio.com forward slash support Um, if you have not done so already please subscribe to my email list Um, typically what i'll do is i'll send out an email for a new podcast episode or something uh, and that's pretty much all I do it for I, I will be doing some additional ones here in the upcoming future uh, because of my new swag shop uh, that I'm getting going here so um, hopefully by the time this episode is live it will be live on my website um, but make sure you check that out so uh, I guess that's pretty much it um, I think, like I said, thank y'all, each and every one of y'all, and uh, until next time, this is K5CLM, signing out, 73 y'all.